Now we're going to talk about the state transition matrix. We talked about the state transition matrix for the discrete time system. Now for the continuous time system, we have a similar form for our state transition matrix. Instead of, however, instead of uh, integers for our time variables, we're now going to have these um, continuous time variables. So the state transition matrix of t and t naught is equal to e to the a t minus t naught if we have a linear time invariant system. So in that case, we have, we have an explicit formula for the state transition matrix. So the state transition matrix in continuous time actually satisfies the properties of what's called a group. So we saw for the discrete time problem, they were a semi-group. Again, those are math terms. Um, and the reason why the, in discrete time it didn't necessarily give you a, a group is because in general we couldn't guarantee the inverse. Okay, in order to have a group, a collection of math objects needs to have an inverse. So in this case, the, the math object, the state transition matrix, has an inverse. So we actually get a full group, not just a semi-group. Well here, these are the properties for this group. So in this case, the state transition matrix, if we use the same time, we get the identity matrix. So that's the same as e to the a zero, e to the zero, which we saw already for that matrix exponential. But this is true even if we don't have a continuous time. And we'll look at, I'm sorry, even if we don't have a, a, a time invariant problem. We'll come back to the time varying problem and see that we get the same kind of thing happening. Uh, and again, we also saw this kind of property when we looked in the discrete time. So using this, this notation, of a state transition matrix is very handy in terms of uh, being able to carry over the same concepts between continuous time, discrete time, time varying, and so forth and so forth. So in this case, we do get an inverse. And the inverse of the state transition matrix, notice we all, all we need to do is sh switch the two arguments. So here, t and t naught, I have t minus t naught. So this would be t and tau, t minus tau, either the a t minus tau. So this would be e to the a tau minus t. Okay, and so it's as easy as switching the two arguments. So it, it, there are very few situations where the in, computing the inverse of a matrix is that simple. Of course, computing the the matrix in the first place that's where the complexity comes in. Okay, but in this case, once you've computed it, the inverse is fairly straightforward to compute. Um, this matrix satisfies a transition property. So the state transition matrix from T to T naught can be written as the product of the state transition matrix from, from T to T1 and T1 to T naught. Um, similarly, uh, the d derivative of the state transition matrix with respect to time, this first argument, is equal to A times the state transition matrix. If we take the state transition matrix derivative with respect to the second argument, tau, we get minus the state transition matrix times A. Now, it turns out that even though I put the A on this side, these two actually commute, so it doesn't really matter which side you put them on. But So this is one of those rare cases when matrices commute. So Now, the input to the system involves the input operator or control map or input map so we saw this in, in discrete time. In discrete time, we had a matrix. This was just a matrix. And the matrix expanded as time went on, as time increased. In our case, we have a convolution. So B is an operator that takes signals in the space where the control signals lie and gives you a vector in Rn. Okay. So one, that is, once you've performed this definite integral, you get a vector in Rn. So even though it looks really complicated, when you're all done, all you get is a vector in Rn. So, so this is the notation, B operating on U from T to T naught, from T naught to T. And it's the integral from T naught to T, the state transition matrix B. So it's this, this is actually a convolution integral. And the input operator has some properties. For example, the initial value if we evaluate this at t naught, t naught, we get zero. We had the same kind of thing in discrete time. This one actually satisfies this differentiation property. If I differentiate this with respect to t, 
That is, if I dif differentiate this integral with respect to t, uh, using the fundamental theorem of calculus, I get this, this situation. a times this quantity plus bu. And finally, we have the transition property. If I go from t0 to t2, that's the same as operating on u from t0 to t, um, t1 plus operating on u from t1 to t2. And that's not hard to see because we have this integral. All we're doing is breaking up the integral into two pieces. And so it's very straightforward. So this is the input operator, control map. It's a convolution operator. Again, it's much more complicated than discrete time. Um, and it, it only considers inputs from t0 to t. In general, the solution for a linear time varying problem now if a and b are both functions of time this is the solution it's the same at least it's the same apparent solution in terms of the fact that we use a state transition matrix times the initial condition and we have the control map operating on u but in this case our state transition matrix isn't e to the at and the control map is not this simple convolution integral we still get a convolution integral it's just not that simple <laughs> simple right doesn't look that simple, but anyway. So how do we get a solution? Well, we start with a fundamental matrix of solution. Uh, we start. Uh, we somehow obtain a fundamental matrix of solutions. Okay. So this is an this is an n by n matrix where each of the columns corresponds to a solution of the differential equation where a particular initial condition. And the initial conditions basically are this. That is, each column of the initial condition is a column of the identity matrix. So we basically solve this differential equation for n initial conditions, each one being a column of the identity matrix. And so when we do that, we get x of t, and x of t then satisfies this differential equation. So by way of example, here is a time-varying differential equation. We can go through and show that this matrix X satisfies these two properties. Okay, That is, if I differentiate this with respect to time, I get this times this back. And if I evaluate this at T equals 0, so for example, this becomes 1, this becomes 1. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, all of this becomes 1. So 2 minus 1 is 1, and so forth. So we get we get the identity. Okay, so we can, it's it's fairly straightforward to verify if you have the correct solution, but it's um it's not that easy. It's like, how did I get this function? Hmm. Not that easy. So anyway, this is this is a linear time varying situation where A in this case is a uh, time varying matrix. It depends explicitly on T. Now, in discrete and continuous time, the state transition matrix uh, for a time varying problem can be actually, once we have the fundamental matrix of solutions, we now plug in tau and take the inverse of that matrix. And this product then becomes the, the state transition matrix. This product then is, is what we need to obtain the state transition matrix. And we can go through and show that by doing this, if we evaluate the state transition matrix at the same times, we'll get the identity. If, if we, it basically satisfies all the group properties. That is, we can go through and show that, that finding it this way is going to satisfy all of the group properties for the state transition matrix. So it's complicated, but it's, it's not too bad. All right. So look at the examples, and you'll see yeah, it's not that it's not as easy as computing e to the at. E to the at is not that easy to compute, but the solution for the time varying case is even more complicated. But you do what you do when you have what you have, right? 